Morning, Commissioners. Thank you so much for coming to North Dakota and having a hearing here in the field where so many people can have access to you and express their concerns. I have to say, serving on the Public Service Commission of North Dakota, you must be a lot more popular than us because our hearings are never this crowded. <laughs> I am honored to be here this morning representing the citizens I serve on the Public Service Commission. Uh, efficient and cost-effective rail service is essential to North Dakota. We depend on this to uh, transport large volumes of grain, coal, oil, and fertilizers. We need the railroads and we want them to succeed. At the same time, we need them to be responsive and to fully comply uh, with their fundamental common carry obligations to the public. So I have a few, I want to offer a few comments just of context for the situation in North Dakota and then offer four measures that I think can help remedy the situation for our shippers. North Dakota's producers and shippers are captive shippers, as we've already discussed this morning. They have a perishable product with no other rail options. They're beholden to railroads who are charging premium prices for inferior service, all the while touting the business's effective planning and profitability in letters to shareholders. Berkshire Hathaway Chairman Warren Buffett described in his February 28, 2014 letter to shareholders, the company's Powerhouse Five. He described it as a sainted group, which includes BNSF, that generated $10.8 billion in earnings in 2013. Later in the report, he referenced extraordinary customer satisfaction and touted BNSF's diligence in anticipating customer needs. Quoting from his letter, he said, like Noah, who foresaw early on the need for dependable transportation, we know it's our job to plan ahead. With all due respect to Mr. Buffett, I don't think our shippers would necessarily agree that BNSF has had the same level of divine intervention as Noah in anticipating and planning for the needs of the rail system serving our customers. That said, I'm not here merely to complain, but to offer some measures to help get service back on tra track. And there's four of them. I'm, I'd like to call for more transparency, better reporting, a temporary field office in North Dakota, and more focus on Chicago. So to doc talk briefly about each one of those. Uh, first, these service challenges beg for no more transparency, and I appreciate Commissioner Miller's comments to that effect at the beginning of the hearing. In May, we asked the railroads, the North Dakota Public Service Commission did, uh, for some simple information that should be readily available given the resources of these large profitable corporations. Both BNSF and CP refused to provide that information and insisted that they are accountable to one and only regulatory body, that's you. This is basic information that will help North Dakota shippers and us better understand and evaluate railroad performance and assist with business planning. So today, I urge you to gather this information and other data that will be requested today and make it available to the captive shippers who feel their service is falling short of the reasonable service and dispatch benchmarks that railroads are obligated to meet. We understand the board has already ordered some biweekly reporting by carriers, and however, we respectfully submit that this reporting has been insufficient. It's difficult for anyone, including your board, to evaluate if services rendered are reasonable without this data. Secondly, you've required the Class 1 railroads to provide seasonal service plans for dealing with a fall peak by September 15th. This is a good step. However, I understand that similar fall peak requests were made last year, and the responses generally predicted both increased traffic volumes and the unquestionability of the carriers to meet the demand. Today, I strongly urge you to take another step and require the railroads to submit more detailed plans and specific service commitments for the fall peak period and beyond a simple letter request that they have in the past. I also urge you to require the railroads to update these plans every two weeks. As we learn this spring, it's vital for the board to stay focused on service issues so the railroads don't back off on their efforts. We had a, you had a hearing in April, and CP said that they would be returning back to normal with four to six weeks. We had the railroads in our office at the end of April, and they pledged to be caught up by the end of July. Both railroads fell far short of these goals. It wasn't until pressure increased in late July that they began to deploy the resources really necessary to improve, improve this service. 
We can't make the same mistake this fall. It's not enough for the railroads to generically point to plan new capital investments. They need to have ongoing reports, and you need to keep a close eye on their plans for allocating resources to meet the needs of the system as a whole. And third, I propose that you open a temporary field office in North Dakota this fall, and for long as, as conditions warrant it. A vast majority of BNSF's increased volumes are coming from our state. This is ground zero for service challenges involving coal, oil, and agriculture commodities. Your office should have personnel here to help monitor the situation, track progress, and serve as a liaison to shippers, producers, and railroads. Finally, I also share your concerns, Chairman Elliott, about Chicago. During all of our discussions with railroads this spring and summer, the one challenge that has surfaced repeatedly is the congestion in Chicago. It's like the black hole of railroad challenges. It's where purgatory, where no one seems responsible, has a plan for fixing it. Chicago is the intersection for so many systems. These are private railroad systems that have received considerable public support through CREATE and other programs. The railroads need to address the congestion that exists there and find solutions for modernizing the system to address the needs of our nation today. I urge the STB to hold the railroads and any other responsible parties accountable for fixing Chicago. That concludes my suggestions. Thank you for your time this morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Randy Christman, also from the North Dakota Public Service Commission. I, too, want to thank you for being here to, to, and recognizing the severity and urgency of, of the, the rail service problems that we have. Appreciate your efforts to restore dependable and affordable rail service that, that, that has certainly been lacking. I expect throughout the day you're going to hear a lot of anecdotal information from shippers about the, the problems they have and, and the severity of them. I also expect you're going to hear more about the progress the railroads have made. I would warn, though, that if that progress is based on strong-arming shippers into canceling orders or on focusing almost exclusively on, on big unit trains at the expense of small shippers, then maybe that progress hasn't been so good. It's just reduced the, the large number of, of late cars, but it maybe isn't so good anyway. Um, at the end of the day, though, I'm sorry to say I expect we're still going to be struggling to figure out exactly how to quantify the extent and severity of this problem. Um, I don't want to get into the business of picking and choosing uh, winners and losers in all this um, and, and shuffling around between ag or oil or coal or that sort of thing. What I expect and what I think you ought to demand is reasonable and dependable service for all shippers. Um, when, when and this gets to uh, Vice Chairman Miller's point about transparency, but when things were just so out of hand this spring, we held our own hearing and we requested more information, um, looking for that transparency to try and get a handle on the problem. We were flatly denied. And I have to say that with that denial of information, it was seasoned with a level of arrogance that I have seldom seen in almost two years on this commission and 18 years previous to that in the North Dakota Senate. Um, and without that valuable information, I have no other alternative but to accept the anecdotal information from the shippers and, and seek help from you all. Um, this field hearing tells me that you also are not so certain about the extent and severity, and I find that troubling. In their denial of our information, they talked about that it was too burdensome to provide and that they would prefer to do business with you. If it's too burdensome to provide it, it suggests to me they're not providing it to you either. And I find it astounding that you wouldn't have the information about their shipping at your fingertips from over the years to compare to what's going on now. Uh, phone companies, including small rural telephone co-ops, um, they gather all kinds of data on every minute of every phone call, where it originated, where it terminated, and whose lines it traversed. Our electric utilities keep enormous amounts of data on, on where the power is generated, whose lines it traversed, time of day usage, outage times. And the railroads say they're keeping basic information like when cars were ordered, when they were supposed to be delivered, when they were delivered, when they were picked up full, and when they reach their final destination, they find that too burdensome. 
I, I really find that astounding. I think it's time for the STB to make a strong stand and demand accountability. Um, when railroad regulation, I want to remind you of this, when railroad regulation was shifted from the states to the federal government several decades ago, Congress recognized them then the special importance of landlocked captive shippers of food, fuel, and fiber like North Dakota. As a matter of fact, there was a special amendment passed called the Andrews Amendment, named after Congressman Mark Andrews, our congressman, who later became a U.S. Senator. And at the time, the big issue was rail line abandonment. That special amendment limited the amount of miles of line that could be abandoned in North Dakota in a year, recognizing the special importance of, this captive, of the captive shippers here. I think it's time to again recognize that importance and uh, because it's not just the lost money if by the people lose money for a few weeks and, until things go. Food quality is diminished for American people. Um, crops like edible beans can be lost completely because of spoilage. Uh, shippers with port dates can lose sales completely. Um, shippers, individual shippers and the country as a whole can lose our recognition as a dependable food source around the world. Um, Less affluent people don't have the option of when someone doesn't have what they want, just going down the block and getting it. There are countries like Angola and Central America, when our product is not on their ship, their people go hungry. It's a serious deal. And frankly, we have power plants, including uh, Commissioner Begaman, your big stone power plant in South Dakota that is not running at full capacity because they cannot get enough coal. It's not a new problem that's been caused in the last year because of oil or something like that. This has been a problem that has been getting worse for many years, uh, actually a, a decade or more. Um, four suggestions here. Um, first of all, the, as far as collecting data and it being too burdensome. There are big, these are big companies, they're successful companies. Um, don't buy into their sob stories. Demand the data. Make the data available to the public. Uh, when some grain got shipped across the country, is no national security issue. Make the data available to the public. Um, clarify what you as the experts think is reasonable and acceptable service. And then finally, compel the railroads to live up to that standard. That's what I ask of you, and thank you again for being here. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lucas Lynch. I serve as Secretary of Agriculture for South Dakota, and on behalf of the state of South Dakota, I'm here to do, read into the record our, the remarks of Governor Dennis Dugard. Uh, dear Chairman Elliott, Vice Chairman Miller, and Board Member Begaman, thank you for coming to the Dakotas today and for your continued attention to our state's shipping needs. We are thankful for the work that you have done to date. The recent orders issued by the Surface Transportation Board have given South Dakota and other states the critical information we need to communicate the magnitude of this problem to the public, advocate for shippers and farmers, and work with the railroads to find solutions. Further, the reported information has allowed us to prepare our farmers for the reality that grain is not likely to move as quickly as it has in the past. They can, for now, prepare the expected lags in shipping times, which will necessitate the need for greater grain storage capacity. Even as I continue to encourage the railroads to do everything they can to provide reliable and efficient service, I am also urging producers to do everything they can to prepare their own operations while we await the expanded rail infrastructure necessary to transport our ever larger harvests. Agriculture is South Dakota's largest economic sector and without reliable rail service, our producers cannot get their products to market. Unlike some other agricultural states, South Dakota relies almost entirely on railroads to move our agricultural products, in many cases to markets hundreds of miles from our borders. Our state does not have multiple class one carriers, which means our farmers do not have the option of utilizing competition to select a lower cost service. We do not have a barge transportation system that other top agricultural states uh, utilize when railroads experience delays and harvests outpace rail capacity. As we consume a modest amount of the grain we produce, so the majority must be sold to out-of-state buyers. As a result, South Dakota is almost entirely dependent upon the Burlington Northern Santa Fe and Rapid City Pier and Eastern Railroads to move our grain to market. If they cannot carry the load, our South Dakota farmers have few remaining options. In recent years, we've been blessed with plentiful harvests, 
Now, more than ever, our producers need timely, reliable rail service. Thank you for doing what you can to help them get the optimum performance from the railroads that service the Dakotas. And thank you again for your time and attention to this critical issue. Signed, Dennis Dugard, Governor of South Dakota. Also, as a lead voice for our state's agricultural producers, our family farmers and ranchers, uh, your focus and attention on this uh, is very critical and continues to be critical in the sense of the economic impact to our state of $25.6 billion ag industry, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of impact uh, with uh, the delays in shipment and costs of transportation that continue uh, to burden our family operations. And so on behalf of our producers, thank you for your time and attention today. And as we celebrate 125 years with our neighbor to the north here in North Dakota, uh, this is a vital independence for our future because we are vitally dependent on sufficient rail service. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is George Sinner. I'm a state senator and I serve on the Economic Impact Committee for the North Dakota Legislature. Thank you, Chairman Elliott, uh, Vice Chairman Miller, and Commissioner Begeman for being here today. You are obviously heeding the call from myself and others for action to address the critical shortage of rail cars in this region. Our losses from these delays are mounting. Some say upwards of $100 million since the first of the year. On December 30th, I was in my hometown of Castleton and witnessed firsthand the train explosion. As a concerned citizen and member of the North Dakota Legislature, I immediately started researching ways to make our train safer. But what was first brought to my attention was the rail backlog that so many of our shippers were and still are dealing with. In January, to the North Dakota Legislature, I brought this issue, and I have been working on this issue ever since. Over the past several months, I have held meetings with stakeholders, including farmers, input suppliers, grain dealers, and financial executives across North Dakota. At every stop, in every meeting, I have heard exactly the same thing. The rail industry's lack of service is severely damaging North Dakota's ag economy. The widening basis of up to and more than a dollar per bushel over normal means that our transportation alone is costing our ag producers more than a billion dollars per year. North Dakota is at the center of North America. The rail system here is our lifeline to the global marketplace. We cannot conduct our business without it. The BNSF and CP have monopolies overseen by this board. If they are not performing, we have no recourse nationally except to turn to you, the Surface Transportation Board. Now we have seen and heard of progress made by the BNSF, and we thank them for their efforts. They appear to be taking this matter ser seriously, which honestly is more than I can believe that the CP is doing. It appears that the CP is more concerned about their stock price than they are about customer service. Recently, I've heard of three CP shippers who are now constructing facilities on the BNSF line because the service and productivity of the CP is so abysmal. But I am not just here to talk about problems. I want to talk about solutions and immediate relief for our farmers who are the backbone of this state and have been for 125 years. One thing we can do is level the playing field. We know that shippers face demerge charges if the cars sit too long on their siding. However, if rail companies fail to deliver on those accepted orders, they suffer no consequences. Companies say they, they pay the price of lost business, but their balance sheets and stock prices say something different. These rail companies are posting record profits, while our farmers continue to suffer record losses and cannot move their products. As I stated, these contracts appear, appear to be completely one-sided. I ask you to level the playing field, making the railroads pay a price to the shippers for the orders that they have accepted and have failed to deliver. Leveling the playing field is just one step in the right direction. But part of the immediate resolution 
has to be the utilization of the board's emergency powers. Today, I am asking the Surface Transportation Board to open these rail lines to other rail companies to come in and help service this terrible backlog. Across this nation, rail companies have agreements with other companies to utilize tracks to improve services. My understanding, prior to 2006, right here in North Dakota, there was an agreement between the CP and the Union Pacific. Now, folks, I have been in private business for more than 35 years. And if there's one thing that motivates a business to do better, it's competition. I believe that temporarily opening these rail lines to other companies will bring better service, a more reasonable rate structure, and alleviate this serious backlog that currently exists. North Dakota could and should, in our region, have a bountiful future. But right now, that future is being held captive by the lack of reliable transportation service. With the projected growth of our oil industry 20 to 30 percent over the next two years, this region's success could play a major role in reducing our nation's reliance on foreign energy sources. However, we need long-term investments in pipelines, personnel, and track. But these things will not happen overnight or even in the next year. So something must be done now. The financial security of this state and region depend on it. These problems have solutions, and these solutions are up to you. I hope that you will take the steps necessary to ensure a successful future for our shippers, our state, and our nation. Thank you so very much for coming here today and hearing from our people. Thank you. Well, good morning, uh, Chairman Elliott and uh, members of the board. Thanks for coming back to North Dakota to hear about the, the prolonged backlog of rail service that we have uh, across the upper Midwest here. Uh, for the record, I'm Tyler Axness. I'm a state senator representing District 16 in the North Dakota Senate. Uh, and was previously on the Transportation Committee in the last session. And uh, I'm here before you today not only as a state senator, but somebody who has been a lifelong North Dakotan that grew up in rural North Dakota in a, in a small farming community. Uh, first job was at a grain elevator. Uh, so I understand uh, basically the, the work that goes in from planting the crop to getting it to the table. Uh, that elevator now sits at capacity uh, and is waiting on, on rail service like many across this state. And uh, it's at no fault of the elevators or of the farmers themselves. So uh, we, we need to find the solution. And I'm glad that this hearing is taking place because I believe it's a good start. Um, you know, working there was many years ago, uh, but uh, the hard work hasn't changed. It's just the, the reliability of our railroad. Um, you know, and what I've heard over the last few months as I've traveled across the state is, is the frustrations from our farmers specifically up in Benson County that uh, estimate that they've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars because they aren't able to get their grain to market. Other farmers in other parts of the state have been told by individuals that basically just put up another grain bin and increase your own capacity. And I think that is completely unacceptable to add that additional burden to our farmers in an already stressful position uh, in the middle of harvest. Others that I've visited with across this state have documented instances where they have witnessed trains sitting idle for days. And not only is that frustrating for people that are waiting to use that rail system, but it's also, in my opinion, a very big safety hazard for our North Dakota communities. And like many in this room, I'm disappointed in the delayed action from many of our officials and the rail industry itself. Uh, you know, I'm frustrated with the railroad's apparent lack of urgency. And quite frankly, I'm frustrated in our state's lack of involvement through our commission with railroad jurisdiction because the railroad themselves don't feel that our rules apply to them. Uh, this backlogged railroad emergency is, in my opinion, a systematic failure for our farmers and other industries that rely on access to these lines. And it's only going to be resolved if everyone is at the table and everyone is talking honestly and that everyone's ready to get to work to solve the problem. So I'm today asking that our railroads reassess their current rail capacity versus what is needed uh, for all of our state's industries and undertake the needed investments to improve the service expected of them. 
And I understand some of those talks have already started, and I'm encouraged to hear that. And as a Surface Transportation Board, I am requesting that you hold these shippers accountable. And finally, I am asking that you consider ways to partnering with resources in the states. In North Dakota, we have the Public Service Commission that has railroad jurisdiction. We need to find ways that the work that they are able to do in our state's century code is going to benefit this overall process and find solutions that are for North Dakota. We, in my opinion, as a commission in the state, have the ability to find the information, as was sought earlier this year, and hold these railroad shippers, uh, their information, transparent to people that need user services. So I'm asking that we all come to the table and work together, and I think that is starting today. So I want to thank you again, because the bottom line is this is a big problem, and the only way to find a solution best fitted for North Dakota is if everyone's working together. So uh, with that, I'll pass the mic along, but I want to thank you again for coming and hearing the concerns, and uh, I look forward to working with you to find solutions for North Dakota and our shippers. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm Dave Fredrickson. I serve as Commissioner of Agriculture in Minnesota, uh, Chairman Elliott, and uh, uh, Commissioner Begaman, and uh, Commissioner Miller. Thank you so much for, for being here today. You are, uh, in essence, shining uh, the spotlight uh, on this issue. Your mere presence here today causes that to happen. So uh, we thank you very much uh, on behalf of the farmers from North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota. Uh, today's farming looks very different from the farming that I did for 25 years in western Minnesota. There are new technologies, methods, uh, and markets which today's farmers must navigate. Of course, some things don't change. Uh, the weather has to cooperate. It didn't last night, and we were awakened by the alarm in the hotel at 4.30. I'm sure many of you were also. So if you see us kind of like that, you know what happened, right? A little too early for us. Um, the harvest is stressful uh, enough uh, at this time of year, uh, and uh, certainly crops have to reach those new markets. Uh, all this is to say that farmers, by their very nature, uh, certainly don't expect many guarantees in life. But that doesn't mean that we don't recognize problems when they're staring us in the face. This summer, my department uh, partnered with uh, Minnesota Soybeans and the University of Minnesota uh, to sponsor a study on basis fluctuation. Uh, and the resulting economic loss to our farmers. And I'm submitting this study uh, today for the record uh, on behalf of our farmers uh, in Minnesota and also on behalf of Governor Mark Dayton. The study shows how farmers lost in excess of $109 million to regional basis costs in the region affected by rail congestion. That's real dollars that would have been in farmers' pockets. We understand more and more uh, is being asked of BNSF and CP Railroad uh, while they are already at or near capacity, yet we have heard that BNSF and CP say they are committed to getting last year's crop out in time uh, for this year's harvest. So we appreciate it uh, when this past June uh, the Surface Transportation Board decided to take a trust but verify approach to the commitments expressed by BNSF and CP. We believe we understood the spirit of that order. It would be to provide the uh, STB uh, shippers and stakeholders with a clear picture of where the problems are and what's being done about them. I don't, know, I don't want to belabor requests for more information uh, that you already uh, are aware of. Uh, however, uh, Governor Dayton has made uh, similar requests directly to BNSF after speaking with their CEO, uh, Matt Rose, earlier this week, and uh, they responded immediately. Uh, and we're hopeful that the dialogue will lead to better communication uh, between uh, the governor's office, uh, the commissioner's office, and BNSF in assisting Minnesotans, Minnesotans to meet the challenges uh, uh, that are, we're facing, particularly as we move into, again, the season change and our concern about propane supply um, and in also ensuring uh, rail safety while growing uh, our local economies. I want to work uh, Governor Dayton and I both want to work with the railroads to address the challenges we face, and I'm pleased to say that that process has started uh, right now. In closing, I want to say that uh, farmers, Governor Dayton and I, are looking uh, to you, the members of this Service Trans Transportation Board, to ensure uh, we have the information we need to plan for the challenges that lie ahead. And again, thank you for your time and attention. I also have uh, in hand testimony from uh, our senior senator, 
uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar, who was not able to be here. Uh, I uh, spent many years working uh, with and for Senator Klobuchar, and for those uh, staffers that are here representing members of the Senate, uh, they have to understand that once a staffer, always a staffer. And so I have uh, in my hand a testimony that I would like uh, to please uh, submit for the record from uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar. Uh, she has uh, uh, witnessed uh, the difficulties that farmers are struggling all across Minnesota and reflects that in her uh, testimony and comments. Thank you very much, Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Elliott and Commissioner Miller, Commissioner Begeman. My name is Doug Goring. I am the North Dakota Agriculture Commissioner. I'm also a third generation farmer here in North Dakota along with my son. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for holding this, this public meeting and hearing. My department provides over 100 different programs to help promote a healthy economic, environmental, and social climate for our state's agricultural, rural, and urban citizens. As you know, we're here because of the extreme service dis disruptions that are preventing North Dakota producers, processors, and elevators from getting their product to the market. It's harming their reliable re reputations, their bottom line, and jeopardizing our domestic and overseas markets. In North Dakota and throughout the entire upper Midwest, a reliable and accessible transportation system is necessary. In North Dakota, for example, 82% of all of our grain and oil seeds move by rail. And with a significant portion of those shipments traveling nearly 1,500 miles to the Pacific Northwest, the distance our products need to travel for export and processing requires timely shipping, especially when we're dependent on rail. The slower cycle times and unprecedented shipment delays from Burlington, Northern Santa Fe, and Canadian Pacific created a problem where the only option our farmers have is to store their crops, which is an unacceptable solution. Both BNSF and CP need to prioritize grain and oil seed shipments. For example, soybean shipments have a very small window to meet market demand in Asia and Southeast Asia. These products must be shipped between October and February, demonstrating the need for certainty in our rail service because we can't store our way to prosperity. Planted acres in North Dakota for corn, soybeans, and wheat are record-breaking or near record-breaking this year. This should be good news. Instead, it's increasing producer anxiety because these products can be trapped in the system on farms or in elevators and not being moved. Also compounding the problem is that over 15% of our 2013 crop is still in storage. In the short term, the agriculture community needs communication about delivery and plans for improvement and to know that their business is valued. BNSF has added locomotives and employees and undertaken drastic rail construction measures to try and meet the future and expanding needs in North Dakota. But there's still delays in cars received or shipped and cost of shipping are extremely high. The more open communication between BNSF and the agriculture community have been appreciated while they work towards these solutions. However, agriculture producers have to be moved, agricultural products have to be moved by both companies. I'm actually more disturbed when I hear stories about individuals that haven't seen grain cars in months from CP. It's clear that the backlog is not the only problem. I'm not telling railroads how to run their businesses. I'm telling railroads that they have businesses here in North Dakota that they need to serve. Long term, it seems that the problems were experienced last spring and winter could happen again this fall and winter. In the spring, the Surface Transportation Board ordered BNSF and CP to provide their plans and data regarding movement of grain and fertilizer because of the fertilizer delivery delays. These delays cost producers the opportunity to move grain at a time when the market was higher and to shore up fertilizer for this planting season. Now this fall, the STB ordered the railroads to disclose more information about their backlogs. The trust between producers and railroads is only weakening. With the 2013 crops still needed to be moved and this year's harvest fast approaching, 
we need to know that there are plans in place so we can enter the 2014 and 15 marketing year with some confidence. Producers want to know that this cycle can be broken and that progress is being made with real solutions for our real problems. Service is critical, knowing that grain, coal, oil, and ethanol all share the same rail system and all need to reach other markets. These delivery problems are pushing more products onto trucks and straining other transportation systems that already have enough pressure, raising safety concerns, reducing efficiency, and increasing cost. At our August 11th meeting in Minot with CP, an option was suggested by a couple of the uh, elevators to them about using short lines to alleviate pressure from within the system and move cars to hub locations where CP could pick them up and move them to end users. This solution was dismissed as not an option. If these problems are going to be addressed and a short and long-term solutions are going to emerge, it's going to require investment in equipment, workforce, and communications with those that are receiving the service. Agriculture and our agricultural markets are seasonal. Products are not delivered year-round. And to retain customers, we need to supply products in line with when historically we, they were received and are currently expected. A thriving transportation system benefits all industries in North Dakota, and we want to work with BNSF and CP. Breaking this cycle of delivery failures is crucial in order for all industries in North Dakota and across the upper Midwest to flourish. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. I think it is very commendable that a number of you are taking such a leadership role and wanting the facts besides just good news. We recognize capacity issues will not change overnight, but I know that you want your producers to be able to plan for the future at, to the best of their ability. So thank you for doing that. We certainly are going to be supportive and help you do that as well and hopefully make more progress. Is it okay if I ask a couple of questions? Of course. So, um, and Julie, excuse me if I butcher your name, Commissioner Federick Chalk? Fedorchek and Commissioner Chrisman, could either of you or both of you say a bit more, either say a bit more about what sort of data you would like to see, what information you need, or if it's simpler, uh, if you'd even just submit it to us, I'd just be interested in knowing more about your ideas for what would be helpful. Sure, that is included in my okay, more great. extensive testimony. I'll give you that. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And, and also, I have have it in my written testimony. Okay. We'll forward it on. But but I do want to say that you know we need it not for just this year, like how they're catching no, no. up, but a longer period. An example being when mm -hmm. when we talk about the success of, of getting that fertilizer out this spring. At my own ranch in the feedlot, a water system that had never frozen up in over 30 years was frozen up this year. We had unprecedented frost in the ground from extremely cold winter with very little snow to insulate the ground. Um, harvest or seeding was a month late. And so that was part of why they got caught up on fertilizer too. It's also given them an extra month with no harvest to get caught up on 13 crop, but it's congested the 14 harvest so look for this again uh -huh. in the coming yeah. season. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And then with the head of three states, Department of Agriculture, I'd just be curious if any of you could address what you think the current status is of the grain markets. And what I'm wondering is, I know we've had unprecedented large harvest last year and again this year, um, but I also understand, at least with corn, you know, prices are getting driven down because uh, there's such a large harvest, and so what I'm wondering is, is even though there's a lot of grain to move, uh, are there buyers for that grain? Do shippers, or excuse me, maybe I should say producers want to hang on to the grain because of the prices? And even if we took some extraordinary measures, uh, is all that grain going to be moving out, or are people going to be hanging on to it? Um, you know, it's a... Uh... On behalf of South Dakota, and I'll, I'll defer to my, my counterparts here as well from North Dakota and Minnesota, 
you know, it, it's incredible the amount of backlog and pent up storage capacity that just doesn't exist. You know, when we look at uh, the 2013 crop, um, that has uh, really congested and, and taken the available space out. When you have a billion gallons of ethanol produced in the, our state, and they, we have plants that have to idle uh, because there isn't the manufacturing or the, or the access uh, to the infrastructure to ship it out, um, the costs are dr being driven down because, frankly, the shippers can't take delivery because uh, th they also incur the risk if they don't have the storage and they have to pile. Uh, so they're going to de-incentivize the producers to take grain because they don't have a place to put it necessarily. And so that's going to continue to drive down the price of the commodities. And frankly, uh, the good years that we've seen in agriculture, it doesn't take uh, too much imagination to look at how much equity is being pulled out of our rural economies across the state of South Dakota because of this backlog and because of, frankly, just not the infrastructure to support what is currently uh, on hand and what's in the fields. We're looking at a 1.1 billion bushel harvest in the state of South Dakota between our top commodities. Um, the, the concern here is the backlog is going to continue to be exacerbated by this pending harvest. Just as the commissioner just said, a, a concentrated soybean and, and corn harvest is going to only uh, put additional pressure and potentially downward pressure on those prices. Well, from a Minnesota perspective, um, it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, some areas uh, of the state are, are clear and ready to go for, for this harvest. My crystal ball is about as clear as, as yours. And we have to remember, uh, we're, we talk aggregate numbers, but farmers farm individually. They don't farm in the aggregate. And so um, all of these uh, issues uh, uh, eventually end up with a face on them, and that's, that's what we're concerned about. So it's going to be hard uh, to tell what our crop is going to look at, like. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of drowned out areas, but what's there really looks good. So uh, time will tell. Because prices have been dropping, do you expect your producers, if they can, to hang on to their grain and to wait to sell it to try to see if the market doesn't come back with a bigger price, a better price, I should say? I would suggest that probably uh, most of them will look at the market, try to determine what they can do. There is uh, limited storage out on the farm and within our elevator system, but they already did that last year. That's a problem. It complicated issues coming into this spring when producers had to go and borrow for the 2014 crop year when they still hadn't paid off debt uh, from operating uh, in 2013. You start compounding that issue. Uh, banks, financial institutions, they need to see product moving. So now you have 2013 crop moving you know, through the system. There's some indications that we're not going to see improvement in prices overall on the futures board. But with the basis being so far out of whack, that's one issue that does need to be addressed because 50 cents on a, a basis, it means a great deal. For example, in my area, $1.15 basis on corn. That is unbelievable where we talk about 20 to 40 cents. If we could get that 60 cents back, that would be meaningful. Uh, if we could get 80 cents of that, that'd be meaningful. That'd be meaningful to a lot of farmers, and you probably see a lot of that change. I think there's quite a bit of frustration looking at the global markets when you see where wheat should probably be in a global market. Soybeans have certainly taken some beatings here lately, and uh, let's hope that we can retain those customers. I think the key thing is, in North Dakota alone, we're going to produce over a billion bushels of, of commodity this year in multiple crops, almost 40-some different crops that are going to be produced. If our basis is that far out of whack, I would suggest it's not just a couple hundred million dollars that's affecting the bottom lines of our farms here in North Dakota. It's probably upwards of 400 to 500 million dollars because of the basis being so out of line. But it's about protecting our markets if we don't deliver soybeans, for example, into the Pacific Northwest and into our customers in Southeast Asia and Asia, we will lose those customers. They will go to the Gulf and they will go to South America. They will definitely be going to South America by February and March. So we need to have those shipments. Wheat is another one of those that we need to stay on top of. But as for in-state, we have Bush and we have the state mill and elevator they have dedicated markets. 
and they have to provide that service into those places. For Bush, they got to get barley because we're the number one barley producer in the nation. They have to get that malt barley into Wisconsin and down to St. Louis. That's it. We have a state mill and elevator that has a lot of customers on the East Coast. They have to get that flour out once it's processed, it's added value to it, it has to leave. If it doesn't, they put it on truck or it sits. And we have ethanol plants that are shutting down across this state, across Minnesota, and across South Dakota. It's a problem. So it's the end product that has to move along with the product within the system, the raw product, to our markets, to our customers. Um, I, again, would like to refer you to the Minnesota basis analysis that we prepared, and you have a copy of that in hand. And uh, because uh, we were able to quantify the losses incurred by farmers, but also you have to consider the losses that were incurred by elevators and other uh, parts of the system that weren't able to move grain at the time that they, they chose to move it. So again, I refer you to the, to the analysis. Vice Chairman Miller, um, I have a special interest in this issue that you brought up. Uh, I grew up on a family farm just outside of Fargo, and that family farm has been in, in my family for uh, over 100 years. But for over 35 years, I have been an ag and business banker here in North Dakota. Uh, my bank started looking at the cash flow problems of farmers last winter, and we noticed a severe drop in cash flow. Now, what's happened since then is because many farmers could not move their crops from last year, they were, they were unable to get adequate financing for this year. In my meetings with input suppliers, a lot of those folks are sitting on accounts receivable that they don't know what to do with. And now we've got this other problem coming this another fall. We also have to make sure that we address the problem of American Crystal Sugar Company, the largest beet sugar company in the world that's, that's based right here in this, in, this, in this community. We have plants up and down this valley. Right now, American Crystal Sugar is getting ready to go into harvest and after harvest to go into production of sugar. To do that, they need massive amounts of coal. And they had two dedicated trains constantly bringing coal to their coal facility north of Grand Forks. Now since that time, recently, they've only had one. We don't know what's going to happen. But we know that if we lose those sugar plants in this valley, we have serious problems. These people are the backbone of agriculture in the Red River Valley. It is very serious, and we ask you to address these issues as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to uh, panel number one. Um, we really appreciate you coming here, and we uh, will take back a lot from what we heard thank from you, you today.